The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Greetings, everyone, and thanks for joining us today uh, on this webinar. My name is Andreas Benacritus. I'm a product manager for content and certification for Ansible Automation, and I will be your MC as well as a co-presenter today. Really excited to have you all here today. I um, want to introduce you to a couple of, of people that are with me. Uh, before I do that, uh, you are here to see and hear about the webinar titled, What's New with Ansible Content Collections? Um, again, our other co-presenters today include Brad Thornton as well as Iftikhar Khan. Um, Brad is a senior principal engineer on the Ansible engineering team, and he owns the overall architectural strategy for Ansible network automation, uh, as well as a lot of the pieces of content. Uh, and he lives in the Seattle area. Uh, Iftikhar, you can call him Ifti, uh, with the good with the good hair uh, is an engineering manager on in, on the Ansible engineering team and oversees all the engineers that develop Ansible maintained network security cloud cont container etc domain collections and he lives in the Raleigh Durham area so before we begin a couple of housekeeping items all of you will be on mute for the duration of webinar so if you have any questions during the presentation, we ask that you use the questions feature, I guess over there, over there on your little, your little dashboard control panel thing with go to webinar. So if you have any questions, please put them in there and we will answer them uh, either in the chat or live as we see them. Um, Ifty is gonna be our, our, our chat wizard and he's gonna keep, keep, keep tabs on that since uh, Brad and, and I are gonna be the ones primarily presenting today. But we wanna make sure that uh, we want to make sure that you know that this is being recorded, so don't worry if you miss something, if you leave early, if you leave, if you aren't hearing this and you came late. We will be making this webinar available in the training and webinar section of Ansible.com by early next week. And with that intro, let's get to it. So let's talk about collections. And what we want to make sure you get out of this are three things. Um, if, if anything at all, it is three things. It is number one, make sure you understand that you can use the current version of Ansible. And right now we're actually at 2.9.11, 2 um, but we wanna make sure you use, you can use today's version of Ansible 2.9 with collections, right? And then the second thing is for you to use qualified collection names in playbooks and roles. And the third thing is to be able to migrate standalone roles into collections. Now, when you talk about Ansible and what people are here doing, in many cases, you could be, I don't know, someone who's writing playbooks and writing uh, writing roles, utilizing uh, modules as part of Ansible, utilizing uh, content as part of collections, or you could be an actual developer, someone who actually develops and creates these collections, develops the roles, develops the modules, and bundles them up and submits them to Ansible Galaxy or Automation Hub. Now, for this purpose, the purposes of this webinar, the primary folks we're talking to are our users. So that's playbook writers. So we've talked a lot about the developer instance, uh, developer persona uh, around writing modules and writing collections. And we, we will be doing more of that uh, soon and ongoing. But we wanted to make sure that uh, your, people are starting to see like in the community, hey, I'm seeing these things about collections. What are they? How do I use them? And we wanted to create this webinar to make sure you all understood uh, like how you could use them today uh, as part of your existing uh, production infrastructure. So that's where we are today. Let's move forward. Now, this is my one sales pitchy slide. Um, and we will be, con the majority of what we're gonna be talking about today applies to any kind of Ansible user, contributor, customer, partner, anything. But before you actually go into that and we start talking about collections, we wanna make sure you understand that uh, we, you know, we do have an offering called Ansible Automation, Pro, uh, Automation Platform, which consists of, you know, three or four different areas. Ansible Automation, which is, you know, the actual bits, and that includes Ansible Tower, Ansible Engine, and a lot of the other pieces that we're building, like Receptor and Runner. Uh, and when we start, since we're piecing out uh, and, and splitting out a lot of the pieces to Tower to make it more scalable. So you actually have the bits, the actual, uh, the actual executable bits that you have and all this stuff is upstream as well we have cloud services so we have ansible automation hub ansible analytics and services catalog 
Those are all hosted on cloud.redhat.com. Now, we wanted to make sure you saw this slide because we're focused on this little green area here, right? Ansible content collections. We are the, you know, the, you know, we are, we are customer zero for, for anything that utilizes Ansible automation platform, the cloud services, uh, and the experience as well. So we wanted to make sure you understood, we're not going to really talk about tower. We're not going to talk about engines so much, but we're going to talk about how the actual content relates to that and how we can use that, uh, with what you have today. So some of you may not know what an Ansible collection is. We actually released this last year. Um, it was released as a tech preview in Ansible 2.8, and it was actually made fully supported uh, as a framework in 2.9. So starting in Ansible 2.9, um, Ansible collections work, right? Ansible collections in, in general are just a standardized way of organizing all the content that you use today. So you're pretty, you might be used to uh, using Ansible roles uh, or Ansible modules or Ansible uh, documentation or even plugins, but they've all been kind of flat, right? They've never really, you've never been able to say, hey, I want to put, I want to put this module and this role and this plugin and make that portable and move that around. Um, that's the, re that's why we created a collection. This actually is a higher level abstraction. So um, think of a collection as a uh, just a, something that will end up being a tarball, right? It ends up being a tarball of all the content that's part of that. Uh, and then you can move that around, distribute it, support it, all of that good stuff. Now, the other good thing about collections is that we have semantic versioning. So we actually are able to provide a good way of, of doing uh, diffs between collections as a whole. So you may have, you know, for example, maybe you have a collection that has all this content in it, but maybe you just updated uh, the role, right? Now, instead of having to dive in and understand, you know, is there a version for the role or a version for the module, blah, 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 we use the versioning at the collection level. So we can actually do that. So in semantic versioning, uh, it utilizes the x.y.z uh, methodology. Uh, Brad will go into a little bit more there, into more detail. This will help uh, understand Know, help people understand what versions of collections they're using. And then, um, you know, as far as Ansible content, the things that we are writing, we actually use semantic versioning to better identify to users what actually has changed. So major versions update the X, minor is the Y, and then a patch level is Z. And again, we'll go into that. The last thing with collections is it's very portable. It's, it's very flexible. Uh, again, uh, it's great uh, for, let's say, disconnected environments, right? We have a lot of people that say, hey, uh, what, how, do I get this, how do I get this content into a disconnected system, right? Well, collections are in effect tarballs, and those can be you know, moved uh, any way you want. Uh, it's much more flexible to do that. So uh, collections are very portable, very flexible. Um, anyone can, pretty much anyone can build them. It's pretty easy to do. We actually have a lot of... Uh, a lot of links and references into how to build collections. We're not going to really talk about developing and building um, collections per se on this webinar. We could do that in a more developer persona uh, instance, but um, stay tuned for that and we will continue to have more developer uh, resources. So that's an Ansible collection. So if you're still not sure you know, how this actually plays, let's think about what you do know. Let's assume you know how Ansible works today. Um, you know that Ansible is a distribution. It's released every, you know, four to six to eight months, right? This is an example between Ansible 2.5 and 2.6, which is, you know, a couple of years old. 2.5 was released. Let's say you want to make an improvement to a module. Um, that gets actually, uh, you know, proposed in the Ansible GitHub uh, repo. That gets reviewed by someone uh, on Ansible. And then maybe it gets merged, right? And let's say it gets merged like literally a month after 2.5 comes out. Now, in order for people to use this, they either A, have to run the devel branch, um, which people really don't like using, like doing in, in production, or they have to wait until uh, 2.6. So that's a long time, right? This was, this was the before collections um, timeframe. So there are some positives and negatives to this, right? Uh, but we feel like the actual, there were more negatives to this as we move towards collections. The, the, real, the real home run for collections is being able to release collections asynchronously from the actual Ansible distribution. So again, in that same example, let's say you have a, a bug improvement 
for a module, that module gets updated and that gets pushed, that's it merged. And now all you have to do is rebuild the collection, right? Um, once that collection is built, that can then be rebuilt locally and then uploaded to Galaxy and or Automation Hub for consumption. This is the nice thing. And, and this is kind of the, the example we have here. And we use Ansible 2.9 again, and we're gonna start hammering this in this webinar, is that you can use Ansible 2.9, um, the latest version of 2.9 with collections today. So if you see something, if there's some new hot version, some feature uh, in the Cisco IOS uh, collection, um, you can actually utilize that today. We actually just, you know, as an example, we released a bunch of that uh, just over a month ago. We released a bunch of new, a bunch of new modules that are certified against 2.9 um, in collection form. So that's the cool thing is being able to release new things uh, asynchronously from the actual executable. So that's where we are today with collections. Okay, now let's just figure out, okay, what went where and how, right? So if you're familiar with Ansible 2.9, we're gonna take a look and see here, everything that's in a box, um, everything was very simple in 2.9, right? Every, like we said before, every single thing was in Ansible slash Ansible in this GitHub. This is the, it, this was the single upstream repo. Now that's great. You knew it was going to be in one place, but it just got really overloaded, right? You, you might've seen 4,000 plus open issues. Um, and then maybe like 2000 open pull requests. It became extremely unmanageable. So in the, in the, this past March, we did a migration and all of the, uh, all of the things that were in 2.9 were now split out, right? So a lot of the things stayed in Ansible and we're calling that now Ansible base, right? That stayed in Ansible, Ansible. And Ansible base is very, 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 very small, right? Um, Ansible 2.9 has what, almost 4,000 artifacts as part of it. Um, 2.10 uh, base, 2.10 base is probably gonna have on the order less than 300. So if you've been around Ansible for a long time, uh, Ansible base is actually gonna look like Ansible of like five years ago. Um, very, very small, right? And the goal here is to make sure that Ansible base is extremely, uh, you know, rock solid, right? We don't want a lot of churn. This is the executable environment. Think of this as like the kernel, like the rel, like the, the, the rel kernel or the Linux kernel. You wanna make sure this stays very, very solid. And that's why we actually split a lot of this out. So. A lot, a few things stayed in Ansible, Ansible. But where did everything else go? Everything else is content, right? Um, and the content was migrated to github.com slash Ansible collections, or it was migrated to vendor specific um, uh, repo in GitHub. So that's where you want to know. And, and you'll know kind of where they went. Uh, a good trick is to find out, you can actually find out where the actual upstream GitHub location is by actually going into Ansible Galaxy or Ansible Automation Hub. Uh, and once you find the collection, there is a link that says show repo, and that will tell you exactly where the source repo is. So we talked about 2.9. We talked about Ansible base 2.10. And by the way, Ansible base 2.10 is probably going to be out here uh, in less than a month, probably August. Um, very, very small. Um, if you're interested in Ansible base, it's probably because you're probably a developer and you want something very, very small, you know, very, uh, very lightweight for your development purposes. Um, and then later this year, we're going to have Ansible 2.10. So what you what what people are used to seeing in 2.9 with everything included, uh, you're going to see that in Ansible 2.10, but in collections form, right? When you actually install Ansible 2.10, you'll get everything you did in 2.9, but it'll be in a schemat, it'll be in a means uh, in you'll see collections under the hood basically, and that will be later this year. So that's where things went. Hopefully that's helpful. If this graphic stinks, I'm sorry, I'm not a graphic designer. <laughs> might, have to get, might have to get that in the budget after uh, COVID here or something. So, um, and I'm in my kitchen. So, you know, if I'm hungry, I can just get a, a soda or something. Anyway, so that's where things went. Uh, and, and, and I wanna make sure um, we've talked about like the what, and I've mentioned Galaxy and Automation Hub. We wanna make sure you understand how, you know, where can you get these collections now? So if you're a community user, obviously everything is still available. Don't, don't freak out, don't worry. Everything that you have is, still has to be made up available upstream. Ansible Galaxy is the de facto place for uh, all upstream content, right? This is community supported. 
Alex, Ansible Galaxy has been around for a while. It's been around many years. It has been extended to support collections. So Ansible Galaxy at first was a place to find your favorite role. Now it's a place to find your favorite collection in the upstream world, right? So that's where you want to find the latest and greatest uh, from everywhere. Um, and all of these things get pulled, right? So if it's in Ansible Galaxy, uh, as you wait for 2.10, you know, Ansible 2.10 will in effect pretty much, will there be a stake in the ground and they'll say, we're going to pull some things from Ansible Galaxy. And that's basically the, you know, that's the source of truth for building uh, Ansible in the future. Now, Ansible Automation Hub, this is the place where you get certified jointly supported content for Red Hat, Red Hat and uh, Ansible subscribers. So if you're an enterprise customer and I, I showed you that, that, uh, that slide in the beginning, you know, our, our sales pitch slide, this kind of goes with that. This allows for, if you're an enterprise user, uh, you have fully supported uh, and jointly certified content uh, made available on Automation Hub. We're hopefully going to be uh, make, extending Automation Hub to being on-premises. So imagine having an, on, an on-premises Automation Hub. So if you're an enterprise customer, that would be really cool to have. Uh, if you're a community user, it probably doesn't mean much to you, possibly. But uh, if, you're, if you're in the, if, if, if automation is part of your strategy, um, Automation Hub is the way to go, and that's where we're going to do it. Um, and we're going to have a kind of a slow and steady approach with, with possibly, um, we may announce at some point in the future, maybe longer life cycles for content, because today um, content versions are only supported until the next version. So imagine having like uh, a longer supported uh, version of, of content today, right? So maybe you run Cisco IOS and that's updated every every two or three weeks, um, you know, that maybe you may want to standardize on a, on a, on a, a version that's very rock solid. Um, Ansible Automation Hub may have a version in the future that could be supported for a lot longer. So that's how you get collections from those two assets. And then finally, what kind? Let's talk about the what here. So what do we actually have? Um, we have 50 plus certified platforms. Um, we've got a lot more out there. Everything in bold here are platforms that are certified. And, and what certification actually means is jointly supported and validated by Ansible Red Hat as well as the partner. So if you have a problem with an Azure module, um, you know, you can file a support case with Red Hat and we will chase down at the Azure people since we know them and love them. Um, we love everyone on this slide, by the way, and we wanna make sure that they actually, uh, you know, help fix issues. So uh, we wanna make sure that certified platforms, and this is where uh, you actually find everything on uh, Automation Hub. Everything else is on is also on um, on Galaxy. We will have more things that are certified. You may see some Windows stuff certified soon, some container stuff certified soon in in the pipeline, and some more Red Hat products. So keep an eye on that if you're if you're interested in in more certified platforms. So I am going to hand it over to Brad because he's awesome, and I'm just a windbag. Uh, talking. He actually has a lot of the technical things. He wants to talk about the actual, let's get in, let's get deep dive into the collection architecture and actually how you leverage that into writing things. So Brad, take it away. Just cue me and I'll, I'll cue the slides. Thank you. Next slide. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, Andreas mentioned my name. I'm, I'm Brad Thornton. I'm an architect and a software developer and an engineer uh, on the Ansible content team. Um, our team develops the network content, some of security content, cloud content. Um, <clears throat> we've got a team of developers. So on the slide where Andreas showed a lot of the certified content, we are contributors to a lot of that. Um, I want to take a step back to one of the slides that Andreas put on the screen. You don't need to reverse, just leave it where it is. Um, but if you think about Ansible a year ago, <clears throat> um, when we talk about content, Ansible shipped with content. So and when we say content, what we're really talking about, the plugins, whether it's an action plugin, a module, a filter plugin, a lookup plugin, an inventory plugin. Uh, for those of you that may be new to Ansible, every task in a playbook is essentially calling a plugin. Every Jinja template uh, may reference a filter plugin. When you load your inventory into Ansible, those are inventory plugins. So when we talk about content, what we're really talking about is the plugin architecture of Ansible. And that includes all the different varieties of plugins we support. If we go back a year or so ago, Ansible shipped with 4,000 plus plugins. And they were 
modules for cloud, modules for network, modules for Linux, modules for Windows, um, a number of different filter plugins to JSON, to YAML, right? You can go through all the documentation and you can see all of the stuff that you got when you installed Ansible. And then on the enterprise side, if you had your own content, whether it be roles or plugins that you wrote, your content would be kept in roles um, on your local SCM, whether it be GitHub or Git or a file server. So there was this gap between how was content packaging included as part of Ansible and how as an enterprise did you distribute content internally? Internally to your enterprise, you distributed content using roles was the way to do it or zip files or tar or however you, your enterprise decided to do it. And then there was this concept of batteries included, things came with Ansible. It is that gap that we have eliminated by our move to collections. So all of the content has now come out of Ansible, been built into collections. You can see, uh, you can go to Automation Hub and Galaxy and see all of the collections that were uh, built out of the content that was previously in 2.9. And the recommendation for the enterprise this morning and the open source contributor is put your content in collections as well. So the point of that story is collections are here. It is the recommended format and packaging technique for Ansible content. In fact, it is the packaging technique that Ansible will be using moving forward. So it's here today. So let's talk a little bit about the directory structure of a collection. Um, you, may be you may be familiar with the directory structure of a role. It's been around for a number of years. Andreas probably knows the history better than I do. But in a role, you had you know, tasks, um, vars, uh, defaults, and there was a library's direction, um, a library folder within the role. So the role contained the plugins and the playbooks, the task files. The way the collection directory structure works is the plugins have moved uh, to the root of the directory structure. So now we had this one-on-one -on -one relationship where the role contained the plugins and, and the task files. Now the plugins are in the root of the collection. So you can have multiple roles that draw from that. So plugins, I guess, are now considered a first-class citizen within the collection. Um, so additionally, within the collection direct directory structure, I'm gonna I'll walk through this real quick. There's a place for documentation. Uh, there's a galaxy.yaml file, which is really metadata around the collection itself. What is the collection name? What is the collection namespace, the version of the collection, uh, the repository of where you might find the source for the collection. There's a playbooks directory. Um, today, the playbooks directory is largely there for example playbooks. Um, it's a little awkward to call those playbooks from um, from outside the collection. So the role is still kind of the primary way to package up uh, task files, if you will. Uh, the plugin folder we talked about, it's where you'll find modules, lookup filter, filter plugins, uh, connection. They're not all listed here, but all of the plugin types can be put into a subdirectory within the plugins folder, as well as a module utils directory. So if you have multiple modules that draw from a common code base, you can also have a module utils directory in the plugins. The roles directory, um, where you can put one or many roles within your collection. Tests, tests for the roles, tests for the collection, and uh, most recently we've added a meta directory for the collection, and we'll talk a little bit more about what is this thing called the runtime.yaml file and why does it exist. Next slide, please. All right, so runtime.yaml. Um, those of you familiar with Ansible in the past, um, when a piece of content got deprecated, let's say a plugin was going away in two years, a couple things happened. The plugin author would modify the documentation for the module and mark it deprecated. The module would also get renamed with an underbar. So if you're really like rooting around the Ansible code base, you would have seen collectors, would have seen plugins and modules that started with an underscore. Uh, that would indicate they were deprecated. Um, both of those were kind of kludgy, right? Because um, when I, I won't get into why it was kludgy, but there were some, some, some interesting things done in the code to support the underscore of the plugin names. So what has happened is uh, to support deprecation at the collection level, there is now a file that can be included within the collection in the meta directory called runtime.yaml. 
So the first thing the runtime.yaml file allows you to do is set the deprecation for uh, each of the plugins within the collection. So as Ansible is running, it interrogates the collection, pulls in the runtime.yaml, and if content is scheduled for deprecation, the user will see the deprecation warnings through the playbook run. So now you can deprecate content without actually having to change the code of the content or rename the module. So deprecation is one use case for the runtime.yaml. Routing is another use case. So if a plugin moves between collection A and collection B, collection A can get an entry in its runtime.yaml file that will allow Ansible to find and continue looking for that plugin in collection B. So as content moves between collections, whether it be in the community or up in certified content in, in Automation Hub, or even your own enterprise content, if content, if plugins are moving between collections, you have the ability to do a redirect. Uh, so it gives, it's, an, it's a handy way for Ansible to find uh, content that was moved out of one collection into another. Um, the runtime.yaml also, a couple other interesting things it does. It allows you to specify um, a key value pair called requires Ansible. And we'll go into more detail here, but the meta file allows you to specify the versions of Ansible that the collection is compatible with, or at least been tested with. Next slide. All right, so let's go into details about, uh, we've talked about the, the packaging of a collection and what can go into a collection, roles, plugins, tests, uh, meta directory. Um, let's dive into, I wanna write a playbook or I have existing playbooks. What needs to change to take advantage of these collections and why do I wanna use collections? Next slide. All right. So let's talk a little bit about Ansible versions. Uh, Andreas uh, touched on this uh, quickly. Um, so today, Ansible 2.9.11 is available. All of the collections on Automation Hub that are certified um, are supported with Ansible 2.9.11. So the place for you and your enterprise to be, or as a community user, today is really Ansible 2.9.11, alongside collections. And the reason I say Ansible 2.9.11 or 10 or later alongside collections is even though Ansible 2.9 shipped with 4,000 plugins, what has happened since the first release of Ansible 2.9 is all of those plugins have been uh, moved into collections. So if you're looking for the latest, greatest version of a plugin or a version of that plugin that has bug fixes in it, uh, or new plugins, you're going to find that content in collections. So Ansible 2.9, 10, 11, and moving forward, for the most part, the plugins and content that was included in 2.9 is largely frozen. So we'll, you'll, you'll see security fixes and probably some really critical bug fixes, but what Ansible 2.9 is not going to get are new features uh, and some of the, the, the more complex fixes that may go to the content. That will happen in the collections. So really, 2.9.10, 2.9.11 plus collections is where you want to be. Uh, this fall, we will release both Ansible Base 2.10. And Andreas mentioned this. What Ansible Base is, is a distribution of Ansible that has little to no content. Uh, there are several hundred plugins that are included in Ansible Base. They are primarily there for the ability to uh, install Ansible, do some basic Linux tests with Ansible, and run the tests uh, that exist in other collections. So, um, like the copy module will be an Ansible base. The uh, SSH plugin will be an Ansible base. What will not be an Ansible base are all of the modules for cloud networking, security, um, Windows. Uh, there's still some Windows in Ansible base, and uh, there's a couple of reasons for that, but eventually Windows will migrate out of Ansible base as well. Um, in September, we will also release Ansible 2.10. And what Ansible 2.10 is, is a packaging of Ansible base plus the collections pulled from Galaxy. So when Ansible is built moving forward, what happens is we simply grab Ansible base, download the tarballs, the content from Galaxy, package it up, send it to PyPy. So whether you know it, uh, whether you know it or not, the future of Ansible is in collections. So at this point, they are unavoidable. 
So whether you're using 2.9 and you want bug fixes, you need collections to get the bug fixes and collections to get the latest content. When you move to Ansible 2.10 in the future, uh, it will include collections, but you'll also have the ability to install later versions of those collections as well. Um, and number three here, the way that the platform is going, the way that Tower is headed, is it will largely be based on Ansible base uh, running in containers plus collections, which we're calling execution environments for lack of a better name. I don't know if the name's gonna change, but internally that's, that's what we've called them, execution environments. So what's really interesting is on the platform, on the product side, uh, running Ansible will be Ansible base plus collections, um, not actually using Ansible 2.10. So slight difference here on where Ansible is going in the community versus where and how we build execution environments for Tower. Next slide. All right, so from the playbook perspective, uh, if you are, if you have playbooks today or you're writing new playbooks, uh, here are the kind of the current recommendations based on the, 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 the state of Ansible. Um, install Ansible, use Ansible 2.9, and install the collections you want alongside 2.9. So even though 2.9, we've talked about this, even though 2.9 ships with content, if you know you're using the networking modules or the cloud modules or the security modules, pull down those collections alongside Ansible. That will ensure you get the latest and greatest bug fixes and versions of those modules and plugins you wanna use. Um, number two, because all of the plugins have moved to collections, there are changes you need to make in your inventory. Uh, this will be most apparent to some of the Ansible network users where um, for each host in your inventory, there's four or five different key value pairs you need to, to specify. As an example here, the Ansible network OS used to be just iOS. That points to a plugin that was bundled with Ansible. Um, moving forward, you wanna to specify to the iOS OS plugin that is part of the collection. The full collection path there is cisco.ios.ios. Same with your Ansible connection type. Um, a bare network CLI pointed to the content or the network CLI plugin that was included in Ansible. Moving forward, you should point to ansible.net common.network CLI. Um, and just a quick mention here, the way that the network collections were built, um, all the platform content got put into platform specific collections. So there's a Cisco, iOS, Cisco, NXOS, Juniper Networks, Juniper, Vios, Arista.eos and the common code got moved into ansible.net common. Um, number three, uh, when writing your playbook, re use the fully qualified names for the plugins. So if previously your playbook used the iOS VLAN module, moving forward, you wanna specify the cisco.ios, iOS under bar VLANs module. Um, where you were referencing filter plugins, the filter plugins have also moved into um, collections as well. So before, if you were doing something simple as pipe IP ADDR as an example, um, that one is now ansible.net common. So where you can and where, uh, where the content has moved, uh, use the fully qualified name. And we've got another slide explaining why that's important. Number four, um, this is really for kind of the enterprise user or the community user that has contributed to Galaxy in the past. Um, the uh, standalone roles are, um, we're moving away from standalone roles. There's really no other way to say it. The, the way to package and ship a role now is a part of a collection. So if you have um, standalone roles in the enterprise, you should start moving them into collections. If you have contributed roles to Galaxy in the past, uh, those should be moved into collections. There is no date where standalone roles will no longer be supported, but the really the focus of Automation Hub and the focus of Galaxy moving forward when it comes to cataloging, indexing, and new features and enhancements, that's all really being done at the collection level. So you're probably going to see um, uh, dwindling 
uh, attention given to standalone roles and increasing attention to collection. And just a quick couple examples here of how to do an include role, just like plugins within a collection, the role has a fully qualified name, it should be specified as well. Next slide, Andreas. And keep me honest on the time here. Yeah, you're good. Right, two quick examples here. All right. Um, on the left-hand side, this is really the recommendation. In your tasks, use the fully qualified name. So in this one, cisco.ios.ios under bar VLANs points to the iOS VLANs plugin that was included in the Cisco iOS collection. Uh, the reason this is the recommendation today is it will work with 2.9, it will work with 2.10 base, it will work with Ansible 2.10 in the future. It will also work with execution environments on Tower in the future as well. So if you wanna stay bulletproof and you're building production grade playbooks, go with the fully qualified name. Um, the thing we have done in the future on the right hand side here, what you're going to see is over time, people will start dropping um, the platform from the plugin name. So what you're gonna see here is between these two examples, the iOS VLANs plugin has become .VLANs. Um, the reason I wanted to bring attention to this is by using the fully qualified name today and moving forward, you'll be certain that you get the VLANs module out of the Cisco iOS collection. Um, historically, there was a guarantee that plugins that were included as part of Ansible had a unique name. Given what we've done with collections, there is no longer a guarantee that a plugin name is unique. So you will find over time that there may be an arista.eos.vlans plugin, a cisco.ios vlans module, a cisco nxos vlans module. So by using the fully qualified name in your playbook, you know exactly which collection your content is being pulled from. Um, so enough on that one, we can move on. Well, I think it's a top tip. I think it's, I think it's important because our, our documentation on, on docs.ansible.com, um, probably for simplicity, shows using the collections directive, right? As opposed to uh, fully qualified names, right? Yeah, right. that's a yeah, that's a great that's a, that's a great call out. You can specify at the top of a playbook uh, a collections directive and give it a list of collections. Um, What's interesting about that is those collections will be searched for in order for each of the modules and action plugins. That collection directive does not work for lookup plugins. That collection directive does not work for filter plugins or callback plugins, right? So that's really at the module and the plugin level. Um, the collection directive at the top of the playbook also assumes that all plugin names are unique, which is not the case moving forward. So if you're, uh, you know, if, if, if it's a Friday afternoon and you're throwing together a quick playbook to run some tests in the lab um, and that you don't believe that playbook's ever gonna go into production, collection directive's great. You know, you're using one collection. The playbook scope is very minimal. Um, it's a quick way to do it. You can use the short names in your tasks. If you are authoring production grade enterprise playbooks, using the fully qualified name is the, the safe bet moving forward. Next slide. All right, so um, we've talked about moving standalone roles into collections. We've talked about the collection directory structure. We've talked about best practices or recommendations of how to use a collection uh, in your playbook. Um, just a couple points here on if you want to uh, build your own collection, um, what are some some, some gotchas we've seen on both the Galaxy side and the automation side. Um, so when you go about building a collection, whether it be for Galaxy or your enterprise, um, identify the scope and document the scope of your collection early on. Uh, what this helps you avoid is a, a collection that has too broad a scope. Um, which may make it hard to find on Galaxy or make it meaningful or within the enterprise may just have too much stuff in it. Um, so you really want to identify the scope of your collection, right? This collection is for uh, platform X or this collection contains content uh, that deals with my CMDB. Um, 
Point two here, collections can be scaffolded using the Ansible Galaxy collection command. So the Ansible Galaxy command now supports uh, a collections keyword, just like it has always been available for installing roles. You can do a collection init uh, and provide the collection name. You will get the collection directory structure scaffolded for you. Um, I noticed just yesterday we don't include the meta directory yet, so we need to we need to fix that. Uh, and there are no direct there are no directories in the plugin directory as well, but there's a readme in there which explains it. So if you want to get started building a new collection, Ansible Galaxy Collection and it is a super handy way to do it. Um, semantic versioning for collections. This uh, we're actually using semantic versioning for all of the um, Red Hat and Ansible maintained collections that we've we put up on Automation Hub. Um, the reason semantic versioning works really well for collections, I think the major minor fix um, schema of semantic versioning trans, 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 translates very well to collection. Um, so in the case you're versioning your collection and you've got a bug fix, you can rev the Z. If you're versioning your collection and you've included some new plugins or uh, new task files or new filter plugins, you can rev the minor. If you're versioning your collection and you've changed your content in a fashion that it is no longer backward compatible or moving forward there's some breaking changes, you can rev the X of the, of the collection. So just a call out here to semantic versioning, super handy. Super handy. Um, back to the runtime.yaml file. Um, you can put the collection version in there. Um, you can put requires Ansible. So we have now support requires Ansible. Um, requires Ansible is a key value pair that uses PEP 440, which allows you to specify a range of versions. Uh, PEP 440 is the exact spec that PyPy uses, so you may be familiar with that. Um, so you can put the upper bound and the lower bound. For all of the collections that we maintain, we've done greater than 2.9.10 and less than 2.11. Um, the reason we've done that is we have tested all of the Red Hat maintained collections against 2.9 as well as uh, 210 beta 3, which I think just came out last week. So we've got the upper boundary as well. Um, maintain a readme.md file in your collection. Ansible Galaxy supports an MD file. Uh, Automation Horse supports a readme.md file. Um, so by using a readme.md file in, in, your, in your repo, it will get uh, uh, rendered on both Automation Hub and Galaxy as the, the readme for your collection. Um, the runtime.yaml is there for both um, community users and enterprise users and product users to deprecate and redirect content. And I'll ask a call out from one of the partner teams here. If you are contributing to uh, content to Galaxy, uh, make sure you add tags in your galaxy.yaml file. Um, certainly makes it much easier for people to discover the content you're contributing. Next slide. And that's it. Four quick go-tos here. We've got a collection user guide uh, and collection developer guide. Uh, quite a bit of what we talked about today is also documented there. Um, there is a new newsletter. I think we're on issue three or four, I six. believe, called the Bullhorn. Six. Huh? They're on six already. Six. Oh, I know. Wow. I know. That's what happens when I go on vacation. Yep, that's um, <laughs> Subscribe to the Bullhorn. If, if there was the slide that Andreas put up front. The uh, this is what the you know the TLDR the takeaway from this those three points of use a fully qualified name migrate your roles use two nine eleven plus. Uh, I would add a fourth one. Um, subscribe to the Bullhorn. It'll keep you updated on what's happening in the Ansible community space. Community collections overview and obviously the Ansible blog always has tons of good collection content. Andreas, I'm going to give it back to you. No, I think and, that's and it. And I, yeah, yeah, I think we're all good. Then I'll just leave the resources slide up. We're all done here. Uh, if you were there, any good questions that we wanted to kind of call out? Yeah, absolutely. There are a couple of questions. I'll try to answer as much as I can. There was one question, very plain and simple: Why Ansible collection thingy was required? So it's it's coming back to you know what were the reasons behind it? You know, if you want to take a moment and just give people high level, you know, from a developer perspective, what were the challenges from a user's perspective so people get a little better context around why we decide to go in this direction. Yeah, so I, 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 go ahead, go I ahead. can give, 
I mean, you you yeah. experienced it right? as a developer. <laughs> I mean, Brad, why don't you answer? Yeah. I think this is the benefits out. You know, definitely outweigh the uh, you know the weaknesses, especially from a developer standpoint. Yeah, I think there's two answers to this question. There is the um, why why are collections why is the collection format the right technology for Ansible content moving forward? And then there's the kind of historical um, marketing piece that I'll let Andreas answer. <laughs> <laughs> so here's here's what we found. Um, Ansible Ansible was one repo. In that repo, there were 4,000 plus plugins. The 4,000 plus plugins translated to thousands of contributors. Those contributors included community contributors, uh, Red Hat employees, Ansible employees, and our partners. Um, issues were coming in from the community. Issues were pull requests were coming in from the community. Um, honestly, it was getting too big. And there is the, the simplest explanation I can give you. Ansible Ansible was getting too big to manage all of that content in a single repository and run all of the tests and make sure all of the tests were run against every change in Ansible base to get to a point where we had confidence that we could do a six month cadence release of Ansible 2.9 and 2.10. Um, we were also seeing, because of the amount of time it took to get pull requests merged into Ansible, we were seeing some fracturing of the community. So we were seeing people that did not want to contribute to Ansible Ansible because it was taking so long for a pull request to get merged. And we were really encouraging people to use roles and publish content on Galaxy. Um, so what we were, we were kind of seeing the content go all over the place, right? There was too much in Ansible Ansible. The enterprise did not have a, uh, I will say production grade packaging format. And there was a ton of content, really good content that was being contributed to Galaxy that really wasn't part of Ansible. Um, so technically the right thing to do was decide on a single format and packaging schema for Ansible content moving forward. Make that the preferred packaging format on Galaxy, make that the preferred packaging format on Automation Hub, recommend that as the packaging format for the enterprise. Andreas mentioned Automation Hub on-prem. Um, that will give you the ability to distribute collections on-prem, as well as use collections, use the collection format to build Ansible moving forward. So it is everywhere as of today. Ansible 2.10 is Ansible base plus collections, Automation Hub collections, Galaxy collections. In the enterprise, we should be moving our roles and content into collections. Yeah, so finally, we have the de facto answer for how does Ansible content get distributed? That, that and we, we, we probably never, Ansible isn't wasn't designed as cloud native, right? Back in the day, right? <laughs> a whole six years ago, right? Seven years ago. But think about yep. it now. When we start start talking about a way to actually, well, if you if you if you struggle and you pull your hair out around virtual environments, for example, you know, all of that is going to get simplified now that you now have a very lightweight version of Ansible that can be containerized, and and by means of that. Each container can then have its own set of collections. Doesn't have to have everything there, right? So think about you can have yep. many, many virtual environments that are designed for the yep. purpose of being virtual uh, by means yep. of having a lightweight Ansible base with Ansible collections, uh, and then you can go from there, right? So it's it's, it's and that's uh, a great so and that and that that's a great point that I don't think I mentioned is. Uh, one of the things that collections buy you is you can pick a stable version of Ansible base for your production environment. Let's say it's 2.9.11. Um, and you can incrementally add and version, add new versions of collections over time. So what you can do today is use Ansible 2.9.11 and you can, uh, you can follow the version of the collection over the next two you know, two years, but you can probably stay with Ansible 2.9.11 as your stable base. So you can almost think of Ansible base as the kernel moving forward 
and the collections as the individual packages that get installed alongside it. So you can pick and choose what you want to change. If you need a new plugin from this collection, you can simply rev that. Historically, when you installed the next version of Ansible, you got the new of everything. You've got much tighter controls on uh, what versions you're running in your environment. Yeah, I would add a few more things. I mean, one of, uh, one of another reason that we had challenges like in the community world, a lot of people, you know, offer us a lot of content based on their needs. And what started happening is since the Ansible core followed a certain release cycle, we started becoming a bottleneck for those individuals to get their code out faster. What collections allows us is basically all of those people who want to get their code out faster can iterate much faster on their own pace, whereas we maintain a stable branch of Ansible base so that we know the API endpoint can be consistent and they can rely on that for a longer period of time. So it offers the right mix of innovation that a lot of our developer community wants to build on top of that, uh, as well as stability to our end user and enterprise customer who want to leverage our you know, stable base and they want to make sure that they get the curated content from a support, you know, with a support statement behind it. So it offers us the balance both from a developer perspective as well as from an end user perspective uh, who wants to leverage our content in the enterprise setting. Yeah, yeah all of the Red Hat maintained uh, cloud network and security collections are on a monthly release cadence now, which we were, we were honestly, we were never able to do that before because we had to wait for the next version of Ansible to be released. So um, as an example, you can use, um, you can use the new ACL modules for all of the network blog, uh, network platforms. They were released as part of the collection uh, three weeks ago. And they are fully compatible with 2.9. Even though 2.10 hasn't come out, you can still use all of the new plugins that are available. Yeah, there's one more question. Will there be a porting document to help move from 2.9 to 2.10? Coding for 2.10 will be radically different from coding for 2.9. Yeah, so let me, uh, yes, there will be a porting guide. Um, there is, there is a runtime, we talked about the runtime.yaml file. The runtime.yaml file allows Ansible to effectively find the plugin. So it's, it's a lookup for the plugin. Uh, what we've done in Ansible 2.10 to ease this transition between uh, the non-collections world and the collections world is there is a file that will be included in 2.10 that will uh, it's a lookup for all of the content and all of the collections that are included in Ansible 2.10. So um, I guess what I'm saying is if you wrote a playbook that was working with Ansible 2.9, it should work with Ansible 2.10 without changes. Um, and that's great. That allows the, you know allows us to kind of transition between the pre-collections world and the collections world. Um, 2.10 is still using collections underneath. The ability for Ansible to find the collection content um, is, a, is not a permanent thing. There will be a version of Ansible that is released in the future where you are required to use the fully qualified names. Um, I do not know if that is going to be Ansible 2.11, Ansible 2.12, Ansible 3.0. I don't think it's been decided. Um, but the long-term goal is uh, for all Ansible users to transition to the fully qualified name. Things should work in 2.10. Um, please start making the changes to your playbooks. <laughs> I don't know how else to put it. <laughs> all right, a couple of other good questions. Uh, yep. I'm gonna start. We covered the porting guide one. The next one is some Ansible module required specific Python modules for example, Pyvo, PyVMomi, or some third-party yep. you know, libraries, will those Python modules be bundled with the collections now? No. That's that's what the execution environment's for, <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean that's, yeah, a, so that's, me... that's a high level. You you we don't want to we don't want to we don't want to be in the the Ansible collection should not 
be in the business of, of maintaining Python dependencies. That should be external. And, and that's where the execution environment comes in, right? When you get that virtual environment, right? Yeah. Right, Brad? Yeah, the collection should identify yeah. what its Python dependencies are, but not include the Python dependency. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's one answer. Um, long term, and this will be, uh, I think we'll be talking about it in the fall, but it, I think it's probably more likely to be released in the spring. Um, Tower is moving in the direction of what we talked about briefly, our execution environments. Um, the execution environment is really, um, is the way that now we can package Ansible content via collections, Python dependencies, and a specific version of Ansible base, um, and, and offer full support on it, which we've never really been able to do anymore. So if you're used to bubble wrap or virtual environments in Tower, uh, over time, a lot of that moves towards a con kind of container first model. So we're pretty excited about that. And we can talk more about it in another webinar, I'm sure, down the road. Cool, I think we're out of time. Uh, I know there's some other questions. I'm sorry about that. We have to wrap it up. But I wanted to say thank you so much for joining, Brad, for co-presenting IFTI, for, uh, for manning the, the chat booth. And if this was interesting to you, we will continue to do stuff like this. Let us know. And I cannot be remiss to uh, remind you all that the Ansible Fest registration is now open. Ansible Fest is a virtual event this year, like many others. Uh, and it is it is 100% zero dollars with the super early bird rate going on now <laughs> until it starts. So feel free to go to ansible.com slash ansiblefest and register. We have a bunch of cool stuff now that we're not limited yep. to, uh, to rooms in, in sunny places. Uh, so we will uh, do that. So we want to say thank you so much and we will see you next time. Take care. Thanks everyone.